my name is Matt Kennedy, and this is the Steadfast Podcast. This podcast exists to use Bible study and theological teaching to encourage you to be steadfast in your faith. Thank you for taking time out of your day to check out the Steadfast Podcast. I hope today's episode is an encouragement to you. As some of you know, my daytime job is in youth ministry. There's a certain point in June where my schedule absolutely gets cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, and that doesn't give me a lot of free time to produce quality episodes. Truth be told, I actually almost rushed a new episode out, but I recognized I really wasn't giving the passage what it deserved. So we're going to wait on that. In the meantime, I'm going to leave you with a two-part sermon series I did last summer on Galatians chapter 3. You're getting part one today, and part two will come at you next Monday morning. Then by the time July 3rd rolls around, we should be back on track. Galatians chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, you can go ahead and be turning to Galatians 3. And I also want you to find Acts chapter 14. I want to show you something in there that is just, I think, going to be more effective for you to look at your Bible or Bible app. If you use a Bible app, that would be go to Acts 14 first. So in Galatians 3, it's what some commentators have called a a series of mountaintops. We're just going to look at two big mountains in the Old Testament, the the mountain of Abraham and the mountain of Moses. And the idea is that we're going to, from those two mountaintops, we're going to get a glimpse at the mountain that they both point to. And that is what Christ does in the New Testament. So this week we're going to be talking about the mountain that we see with the life of Abraham and the next week in Moses. And uh, hopefully make some sense along the way. Uh, it's a kind of a dense uh, section, but I believe we can, we can work through it. All right, so now that I've bought time for us to get to, to Acts 14 too. So I'm going to read um, out of the first verse of Galatians 3, chapter, uh, verse 1, and uh, we'll get started. Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. And in this, I promise we're going to get to Acts 14 in just a second. In this, Paul is using the language of of pagan magic. He is literally saying, who's cast a spell on you? What kind of voodoo is present in your church? And he doesn't actually think that like Harry Potter showed up and did some kind of spell on the people. What he's doing is he is expressing how shocked he is that they have so quickly turned away, that they've so quickly changed. There is a strong influence in their church that has led them astray, such a strong influence that has moved so quickly, Paul just can't believe his ears about what he's hearing about the church of Galatia. I mean, he was just there. If you see that that second sentence, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. That doesn't mean they were present at the cross. Paul is referring to his time in Galatia. It was his first missionary journey, and he is going from town to town in the region, and he is telling people about Christ crucified. He is explaining the gospel boldly and clearly to them. They heard, and so many believed. Mainstream scholarship says that between that time when Paul was doing that and the time of uh, him writing the book of Galatians was maybe a year or less. And this is where Acts 14 comes into. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app, turn to Acts 14. Look at verse 24. So in verse 24, and this is intentionally not on the screen, it's just because I want you to see it in the actual text here. It says, then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. All right? Pisidia is in Galatia. Pamphylia is not. So this is the time he leaves the area of Galatia. Okay? Now, scholars tell us that he wrote Galatians before chapter 15 starts. Okay? So if you look at this, how close my index finger and thumb are. Look in your own Bibles if you haven't opened in front of you. That is how quickly... The influences came. The influences were believed. And word of their change of belief got all the way to Paul, and he wrote this letter. Look how little space that is in your Bibles. 
That should like raise a red flag to us that influences can come in so quickly and so easily. And that's actually our first point today. We can be influenced so quickly and so easily. If they were able to go from the gospel that Paul taught them to something that Paul can't even believe his ears that they are believing now, in that short of space, in approximately a year, man, what what can influences do to us today? What can our influences do in what we believe today? Do you ever stop and think why you think what you think? Or why you believe what you believe about God, faith, the world, other people? Do you ever stop and think when you hear new ideas, when you hear someone teaching something, like, wait a minute, should this go through a filter? Is what they're saying true? Or are they using persuasive language that can make me think that something that is untrue is true? I don't know if there has ever been a time in the history of mankind when there are more potential influences as there are today. I mean, if we did a a poll in here, a survey in here, we could probably come up with a hundred different things that are influential in our lives, right? Everything from what we choose to watch on TV, whether that's entertainment or news, anything from what we read, whether that's from uh, authors that we know or or things that are supposed to be about events that happen, uh, what we scroll on our screens, what we watch on YouTube, what we see other people talking about on Instagram or Facebook. We live in a time when there are so many influences. And the thing is that there are so many influences that we don't even recognize them as influences anymore. We're just taking in stuff like crazy all of the time. And it can be so easy for these things that we read or watch or look at to change how we think, to change what we believe, to change from where we were at the beginning. And church, this is a a dangerous thing for us because we are to be disciples of Christ. That means we are to be like Christ, not like every influencer out there, not like everyone that has an opinion that shows up on our phones or on our televisions. We are to be like Christ. And I, I know that it's so easy to come away with a thought, well, like, yeah, like I know that happens to people on my Facebook friends list, but it doesn't happen to me. It's like I am wise and I am mature and I am this and I am that. Well, unfortunately, that's just pride because When Paul's talking about temptations in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he then says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he falls. In other words, pride comes before the fall. When we think that we are not influenced by other things, that is when we are most primed to be influenced. When we think that it is Jesus who is our only influence in life or our main influence in life, and yet we are spending hours and hours and hours taking in stuff from our phones or our TVs, man, we may just be falling. We may just be stumbling through every other influence so that our image of who Jesus is can be more and more blurry, can be more and more pixelated, can be harder to see. For the Galatians, uh, they were being influenced by a group of people we call the Judaizers. The short of it is that this group of people, the Judaizers, believed that essentially you needed to be a Jew or practice Judaism before you could be a Christian. In other words, you needed to keep the stuff of the law and do the things that they did and then believe Christ and then you could be a Christian. So they have like this one two step thing, right? Like you have to do what they do plus believing in Christ. They are adding something to salvation. And any time we add anything or attempt to add anything to salvation, that is clearly a gospel issue. That is why Paul is so alarmed and using language like, oh, foolish. I have never started a sermon with oh, foolish before, but it feels fun. It feels like something that could come into the uh, routine. Um, But here, there are some influences that are just too strong for Paul to ignore. In our life, there's a lot of influences out there that we can see from a mile away and we can instantly shut down, right? Like if we were to ask anyone in here, just about anyone in here, I would say, it's like, should we be influenced by Hollywood? Most of us would say, of course not. That's crazy. But then there's other influences that we can see where people can claim the name of Christ and people can throw out a Bible verse and we can let that just bypass all of our filters 
and assume they're someone that we should take in. Well, the fact of the matter is that when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, Satan used Bible verses. I should say Satan misused Bible verses. And in today, there are so many people who claim Christianity and misuse Bible verses for the sake of their own influence and standing, who try to use Jesus to get their own messages across, and that is so dangerous for us to fall into because it can be so deceiving, right? I mean, be honest. Like, when you see someone, whether it's on TV or post on Facebook, and there's a Bible verse on there, doesn't that let our guard down a little bit? Don't we kind of automatically assume that they're going to say something that is true and honoring to Christ? When the fact of the matter is, they might be, but they might just be an influence that is using Christ instead of seeking to be used by Him. And church, that is a huge difference in those two things. So maybe the next time a TV personality, a, an influencer, a network, or someone on YouTube, or anyone else refers to Christianity, we should stop and think like, hey, maybe I should turn to that place in my Bible to see what's actually going on there. Maybe I should think about this. Does this line up with the ways of Christ that, that I have learned that I know? Is this gospel? Or is this someone seeking to use Christ for his own gain? And that's a very important question. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm afraid we are becoming discipled by the wrong things all too often. And we can misrepresent Christ himself by letting these influences run crazy, which is what's going on in Galatia. I mean, when you think about when Paul was there, you know that he gave a similar message to he gave to the other churches. Like in Ephesians 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So then, why then were they so easily tricked into thinking that works did it? Why were they so easily influenced away from this simple but powerful message? Why? Well, that's, that's really what Paul wants to find out. That's what he's writing to them about. Now, when you go to the doctor, the doctor... Now, I'm not great at going to the doctor. I'm going to admit that. Uh, probably should go more regularly than I, I do. But the way I remember going to the doctor is that the doctor will ask, like, diagnostic questions, right? They'll just start throwing out stuff, um, trying to get an idea of where your health is. Or if something's wrong with you, to get at the symptoms. They'll ask diagnostic questions, right? Well, in this next section that we're about to go into, that's kind of like what Paul is doing. But he's not getting at a, a physical ailment. He's trying to ask them gospel questions to get at what is going on in their lives. What is where they have strayed from. And I don't think Paul intends for them to write him back. I don't think Paul intends to them to have this treaty that they send him. It's like, in regards to your first question, here's what we say. Here's what we say to the next question. I think he's wanting to get them to think. I'm want, I think he's wanting them to have some kind of red flag, some kind of alarm go off in their head to say, wait a minute, we have strayed. We have gone away from the original message that we were given. Something is off, something is wrong, and we need to look at it. I think it's very worth our while to diagnose ourselves just the same, to seek to realign ourselves with the gospel, to understand that we can believe the facts without living in its truth. And we got to get back to that truth so that we can live in it and not be as the church of Galatia was. Because our hearts can drift so quickly to wanting to trust the works of our hands instead of the finished work of Christ. So as we get on to this diagnosis, I, I would like for us to take it in a moment and pray. Pray that God would search us Pray that God would, would help us be honest with ourselves. Because I know my heart is, has this tendency that it likes to be like, you know what, that is true about so-and-so. Um, when in reality, man, it's probably more true about me. If there's something that's, uh, that's a miss, that's pointing out uh, an area of sin, my heart needs to look at itself before it looks to anyone around it. So would you pray with me? Father God, you are good and gracious. You are kind and merciful, Lord, and I, I have evidence of that right here, that you have revealed yourself to us in your word. Lord, you could have let us go in any way that uh, our hearts would lead us to, 
to the ways of destruction, Lord, but you in your mercy and your love and your kindness revealed yourself to us, revealed the way that you have prepared for salvation for us, Lord, revealed that we can know you and we can have a relationship with you. Lord, I ask now that as we, we go through these questions that uh, your servant Paul once asked, Lord, I ask that you would shine a light on our hearts, Lord, that you would give us honest ears to to hear what he's asking, to hear what he's saying, to hear what you have said through Paul. Lord, help us be honest and help us have the courage to face it. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so our first point was that we can be so quickly and easily influenced, right? Now here's our second. We must hold to our journey with Jesus. Verse 2, Paul says, Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So he's taking them back to the beginning, to their first point of belief. How did it start? Did you earn your way into believing Jesus? Like as you sat there and, and heard the gospel, did you actually work for it? Or when you were there, when you were in that moment, did you just hear the word of God and something sparked inside of you? Did you feel the conviction that he brings of sin where you could see like, man, I am outside of his design for my life. I have rebelled against the king of the universe. Did you hear that even though that you had sinned and were far from God, that he had made a way for you to be brought into his family, that out of love, Christ was crucified in your place. That out of love, Christ was in the wrath of God for your place. That out of love, that Christ has offered this to us so that it could be heard and believed. Like Paul's saying, like, hey, if you didn't earn it at the beginning, what are we even talking about here? If it for you was an offering of grace, why are you trying to add these extra things on there? So for us as believers, what we have to understand, what we have to look at is our beginning, our, the beginning point of our journey with Christ. Like, do we remember that moment when we first heard or first understood, I should say, the gospel, where the gospel did something in us? Paul says in Romans 1.16 that he is not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation meaning that the Spirit came in when, he, when we hear it, and something's different. Look, for us, was there a moment when that happened? Because one explanation why we can be so prone to be, I deserve this, or I earned that, or I'm working my way, I'm good because I do this, is because we didn't have a moment where we experienced the grace of God. And if that's where we are, then we need to go to the beginning. If that's where we are, we can't say like, oh, this was my moment that I heard the gospel, that I believed the gospel, then that's where we need to start. That Christ was crucified in your place, that he bore the wages of all of your sins so that you could be called a child of God, so that you could enjoy him forever in heaven. How did it start? He says, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So then after you believed, after you had that moment with Christ where you heard the gospel and were transformed by the Spirit of God, then are we saying that after that you earned everything? That In in church circles we use the word sanctification, just the process of becoming more like Jesus. So after you were saved, Paul says, are you really so foolish as to say you became more like Jesus on your own power? That you worked your way into looking and acting more like Jesus? Uh, Yeah, we have like disciplines that we are to engage in. Like we are to read the word. We are to spend time in prayer. We are to spend time loving and serving other people, of course. But if we're honest, we can do those things until we are blue in the face. And if the spirit of God is not working through those things, we're not going to become more like Jesus. We are desperate for the spirit of God to work in us and through us. And we can use Paul as an example. Paul would be a, a great example of this. Um, this, is, this letter is towards the beginning of his ministry. If we fast forwarded to the end of his ministry when he wrote uh, 1 Timothy, he says in 1 Timothy 1.15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners 
Look at this last phrase. Of whom I am the foremost. The foremost. Some translations have said the chief of sinners. In other words, he's looking at his own sin and saying like, man, this is as big a deal as anyone else in the history of the world. Now that means Paul, after all that he had been through, after all that he had suffered, after all that we would look at his life from an earthly perspective and say, look at all he accomplished. Despite the resume that he puts forward in this, he says, I am the foremost of sinners. Like I'm at the top of the list. My sin's as big of a deal as anyone else's. And now I want you to, to notice, he says, I am the foremost of sinners. Not, well, once upon a time, I was. You see, th- this guy, he wrote more books in, in the Bible than anyone else. There's a, a tie for second place between Moses and John. They both wrote five. Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. John, a little less creative. John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, then Revelation. Um, he really had a plot twist there at the end, right? <laughs> But if you add those two guys together, it's still less books than Paul wrote. If anyone has the claim to be like, and look where I am now, it would be Paul. But on Paul's journey with Christ, as he was genuinely pursuing Christ, genuinely following Christ, what happened is it was like there was this bright light, and he was getting closer and closer to the light. Have you guys ever looked in a mirror that is unfortunately well lit? right? And you see every flaw that's there. Okay. I have seen every flaw that is here. And the brighter the light gets, it feels like the flaws become more and more evident. And that's what Paul is experiencing. But the light here is Jesus. And as he's growing closer to Jesus and measuring where he is compared to who Jesus is, he's like, well, I I see this sin. I see this sin in my life. I see this thing that I have not yet surrendered to him. And he is looking at this and he's saying, man, I am the foremost of sinners. Because he's closer to the light. He's closer to Christ. But the thing about it is, what that does for us if we're honest about it, and if we're applying the gospel to us, it doesn't lead us to a place where we're depressed about who we are. It leads us to a place where we are more grateful for the grace of God in our life, and we are less clinging to the things that we have accomplished because we know in comparison to the grace of God that we have through Jesus Christ, the things that we have accomplished amount to nothing. So Paul's looking at his life, And he's looking at the the, the sins that he sees because of his proximity to Jesus. And he sees how his works have accomplished nothing. So what he says to these people is he says, Oh, foolish. Are you so foolish? In verse 3. In other words, just stop it. Works don't do what you think they do. The closer, if you really understand who Jesus is, the closer you draw to him, the more grateful you feel not the more self-righteous you get. But here's why that workspace system becomes so attractive. It's because it can give us feelings of superiority, right? It can make us feel better than someone else. It can make us feel like we're a step ahead of of our neighbor. And I I think if we are honest, or maybe I'm just up here confessing sins that none of y'all ever struggle with, but if we're honest, there's something attractive about that, about feeling a step ahead of someone else feeling better than someone else. The gospel just doesn't leave room for that. The influences that are far from Christ can, that claim him can do this too. They can say, look how we are better than they. But here's, here's the truth. We want to cover our flaws with feelings of superiority. But church, that is self-righteousness. We want to cover our flaws with feelings of superiority, but that is self-righteousness. Jesus calls us to cover our flaws with his grace. Church, that's gospel. That's what the gospel is about. We see our sin, and the greater and more honest we see that sin in our life, the bigger God's grace is in our life, and the more grateful we feel towards him. But church, guess what? Then that means we turn around And we're not so rude, we're not so hateful to other people because we understand where we are because of the grace of God. 
Not because of who we are, not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ has done for us. Jesus calls us to cover our flaws with his grace. That is gospel. If we find ourselves in a place where we are feeling superior to others, that's got to be like a check engine light that comes on. If we start like downgrading the people that are around us because of what we feel like we are doing, church, that should be a check engine light. Something is off. Something needs to be looked at. There's something going on in our heart that is not lining up with the gospel that Jesus has given us. Because the gospel should be one that flows grace. Not putting others down. We're so prone to messages of of do better. And to be honest with you, there's a lot of areas that we really could use a lot more effort in, right? More discipline in. But we have to keep an eye on this because the message of do better is a very short, dangerous step away from I deserve because I am better. Church, let the gospel seep into our hearts. Let us see the grace of God that is being lavished on us. And then we can't have messages like that. Our message is that Christ offers to take our flaws. Christ offers to take the punishment of all that we've done. Christ has earned what we cannot earn, and therefore I cannot act like I'm superior to anyone else because I've just been given grace. Verse 4. Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And now, really, we, we don't know much about their suffering. We don't know much about the persecution that came their way. But what we do know is that when Paul was in Galatia, and you can see his time in Acts 13, verse 14 through 14, 24, is that, that he faced a lot of resistance. He faced a lot of hardship. I mean, there was one time where he had people following him from town to town. There was one time he got stoned, which means people threw rocks with the intent to kill him. And they thought he was dead, so they left him outside the city. That is what I would call suffering, right? I would call that resistance. If people throw rocks at you trying to kill you, that is resistance. I know that was a really deep thought. You're welcome for that. Um, So it is reasonable to infer that if Paul went through that when he was in Galatia, the church would probably be a step behind that as well, right? The church could face similar things. So the thing about suffering is that it can... See if something's real or not. He's like, hey, if you went through this, wasn't it real? I mean, if you didn't forsake him when you suffered, doesn't that mean something really happened? That this is real and genuine in your life, and yet, though they could have gone through those things, that wasn't what pulled them away. It was an influence. It was bad teaching. It was something that they were persuaded with. Now that they've swayed, not by hardship, but by influences, they've got to hold to their journey with Jesus, no matter how short their journey was. Verse 6, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So to help make Paul's case that works won't do the trick, he's taking them back to Abraham, which for many of them, if they came out of Judaism, this is the guy their identity's in. This is the guy they're clinging to. This is the guy that's like, see, we're just following after Abraham, and if Jesus is in the line of Abraham, then we're just doing what we're supposed to do. So Paul, being great at making arguments, brings up Abraham and says that Abraham is the place where we are going to find our model that Abraham will be our example. But we don't, we don't talk much about his beginning, right? Like when Abraham was called by God, most believe that he worshipped a pagan god. He was worshipped a false god. Where he was, it's not like he was singing how great is our God. He was actually lost in his own sin and idolatry. And if he was lost in his own sin and idolatry and worshipping false gods, then he certainly did not deserve or earn... God's call in his life, right? I mean, if he's worshiping a different God than God, then there is nothing he could say, nothing he could bring to the table of saying, this I deserve. So it wasn't from Abraham's goodness, but it was of God's grace. His story can be summed up pretty much with he was lost, he was offered a promise from God, he believed God, and then his life was radically transformed because of it. So he was lost, 
He was offered a promise by God, he believed God, and then his life was radically transformed because of it. That should sound very similar to what salvation looks like in the New Testament, right? Being lost, being proclaimed Christ, the gospel being proclaimed, the promise of God in the gospel, it being believed, and then people's lives being transformed radically. So Paul's looking at Abraham and says, that's the model. This is how God has always worked this. It is by faith and then counted as righteousness. It's always been this simple. It's always been this gracious. It's always been this loving and amazing. God offers, it is believed, and that belief sparks a transformation. Abraham being the model of faith means that, just as it was for Abraham, so it is for everyone else. We get God through faith. Verse 7. Know then that it, was, that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, If you shall, or in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So he says, Know then, understand, Abraham is the norm. This is the plan God had set from days of old that God has continued throughout history, that belief in the promises that he offers would be counted as righteousness. Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us that without faith, without this belief, it is impossible for us to believe God. In verse 8 here, Paul references Genesis 12, 3, which is where God promised Abraham, he says, in you shall all the nations be blessed. Now, all the nations means not just Israel, right? All the nations means all the nations. That means Jews and non-Jews alike. Jews, Gentiles, everyone else shall be blessed through the offspring of Abraham. So what that tells us is that Abraham doesn't just belong to the Jews, but serves as the model for everyone. So it is crazy to to demand someone of non-Jewish heritage to become a Jew before they can follow Christ. Paul's looking at it, it's like, no, you guys have missed God's plan of salvation from days of old. His original plan was that all the nations would be blessed through the offspring of Abraham, which would one day be Jesus Christ. It means that God's plan all along was to bring those who are far from him near. It was always his plan to offer a promise, and for that promise to be received through faith. So, so far we, we recognize that we can be influenced so quickly and easily. And we recognize that we must hold to our journey with Jesus, where it began, where it continued, really all along, all the way back to Abraham. We must hold to our journey with Jesus. And in this last section that we're going to do today, we must hold to the truth of the gospel. Verse 10. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified or made right before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather, the one who does them shall live by them. So, This is part of it that gets a little bit more dense here. And I I just want us to take some uh, pretty simple gospel truths from this. So Paul's talking to a group of people who have been influenced by the Judaizers. And the law is what the Judaizers were using to elevate themselves. For them, their righteousness or being made right with God was always connected to how they kept the law. In other words, I perform, therefore I am accepted. I do, so I am loved. And as we hear those statements, there should be something in us that says, well, that's not gospel, right? Because we were loved, we were accepted before we knew it, right? Because that moment of salvation that we had, God worked before that. He was always working before that. In their mind, they were adding their own works, the righteousness gained from Christ, But Paul says here that they're under a curse. Now, saying someone is under a curse for what they are teaching and believing is a pretty strong statement, right? 
Where in the world could Paul get such a strong statement like, they are cursed? Well, he's getting it from the law that they're citing. He's getting it from the law that they are living by. He's giving it from the law that they're using to push themselves up and to push others down. He is referencing Deuteronomy 27, 26, where it says, Cursed be anyone who who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. In other words, in this law, where there are 613 different commandments, 613 is a really big number, 613 commandments. If you do four of them out of 613, you're cursed. If you do 612 perfectly out of 613, you're cursed. Either way, you're cursed. Paul is saying, hey, you think you are adding to Jesus by bringing your righteousness from what you have performed in the law to the table, when in reality, since none of you, not one, has upheld all 613 your entire life to perfection, every single one of you doesn't bring righteousness to the table, but you bring a curse to the table. That's your contribution to this. To salvation, you bring the curse of sin. That is our contribution it doesn't matter how many are right. If there is one law broken, it's still in, the, still in the curse. Paul is letting them know that they haven't accomplished what they feel like they've accomplished. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Again, referencing Deuteronomy, which is part of the law, Paul states, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. See, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. That means that anyone who had committed a crime, committed an act that was deemed worthy of death, were to be hanged on a tree, were to be shown that they were under the curse of death. Now, if we flip to the New Testament, what we're going to see is that the things that are worthy of death are the wages of sin. Sin is what deserves death. Sin is what earns it. Sin is what any departure from the law, any departure from God's design is what does death. So in the law, it is foreshadowing the cross of Christ by saying anyone who has the curse of sin in their life deserves to be hanged on the tree to show that they are under the curse of sin that the law has revealed. The gospel is simple. Jesus was on the tree in our place. The works of our hands, the words of our mouth, the thoughts in our head, the motivations of our heart, all rebellion and death, all accumulating this curse And it was Jesus, because it was for God so loved the world that Jesus became the curse in our place, that experienced the curse in our place. That time, earlier this morning when I was reading out of Luke, and Jesus was seeing the cup of wrath, he was seeing the cup that it belongs to this curse, the appropriate and just punishment for the curse that we have all earned. For it is in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that says, For our sake He made Him, the Father made Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. This is the same concept and truth, that we earned the curse. And though He who had known no sin became sin, He became the curse and was on our tree paying for our curse, paying for our sin, so that in Him we might be gifted the righteousness that He earned. Because there was one that kept all 613 commandments all His life, and that's Jesus. And so He gives us the righteousness that that would earn so that we don't have to be on the tree. So that we don't have to be, as Deuteronomy foretold, cursed is the man who is hanged on the tree. For it is Jesus who is experiencing the curse on our behalf. The only way of righteousness is to trust Him. That because He was nailed to a cross, hanging there on the tree, and experiencing the curse of sin on our behalf, in our place, those who believe in Him can be free. Free of the curse, free of the penalty of the curse, 
free to walk in newness of life, free to enjoy eternal life with our God, that if we believe He paid it all, then we can be like Abraham, who believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. We can be like Abraham. All he did it was he believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Just like Abraham was offered a promise by God, received it through faith, and was counted as righteous because of it, here on the cross of Christ, we are offered a promise that if we believe in Him, if we place our trust in Him, then God will count us as righteous, meaning that our death penalty is transferred to Jesus that we can trade in all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our curse, all of our transgressions to Him, and that they can be fully paid for, that we can be called righteous. For the believer, we cannot be swayed like the Galatians were swayed. We can't be pulled away from this, because the instant we get pulled away from this truth is the instant we start relying on our own self-righteousness. That means the instant we start adding burdens to our life, because if we go down that self-righteousness trail, what that means is if I do not perform, then am I even accepted? Or if I do perform, then why am I not getting more? Both of those things are train wrecks. So for the believer, we have to see that check engine light that comes on. We have to see those feelings of self-righteousness that can pop up so easily. We have to see the influences that are trying to pull us away from the truth of the gospel and understand that we need to be re-centered, that it was because Jesus earned it, that God offered it, that we can believe it, and that we can get His righteousness. Anything else? Paul would say, oh foolish, who has, be- who has bewitched you? We need to rest in the truth that if you're a believer in Christ, because you did not earn it, because it was earned for you, you were loved, you were delighted in, you were cherished. You're a member of a family that can never mistreat, that can never abandon that you're not alone, that you're never forsaken. We need to rest in that. For the unbeliever, you've got to believe Jesus in your place, that through Jesus dying on the cross that you may have your sins paid for in a new life in Christ, that through faith you can be counted as righteous before God and enjoy all the splendor rest of being One that he looks at you and says, this is my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. The gospel is for both the believer and the unbeliever. Thanks for listening to the Steadfast Podcast. I want to remind you that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Paul wrote this, quote, Therefore... My beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. End quote. So in light of biblical truth, let us be steadfast, immovable. Let us remember that through Jesus, not one labor is in vain, not one trial is in vain, not one effort in all of our lives is in vain. Because He gives purpose, and that purpose rings through eternity. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget, if you've got questions you would like answered, you can email me at matt at steadfastpodcast.com.